Liam, I love all the pictures of the bike rides you guys have been doing. I'll tell you, it's been like the greatest gift out of all of this is that we've had so much time to spend doing things in the family. And it's, you know, kind of nice. We're not spending hours a day commuting and, and that kind of thing. We're home and we can we can do those things together. So it's been good. Right. And, and you're grooming your daughter to have an early bike addiction like yours. I'm trying. I tried with my son. It didn't take. So I'm trying to get it going with my daughter now. I'll get somebody in my family to ride with me eventually. All right. We are live. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, listening in here. I am really proud and uh, pleased to present to you today a good friend of mine, also a local Scarborough resident, Liam Summers. Um, by way of a quick intro, uh, Liam likes to describe himself as just a guy who helps people uh, and hates people who steal from other people and wants to help. That's how he describes himself. Now, if you talked with his employer, they might formalize that introduction a little bit further uh, by you know, letting you know that Liam is actually the head of online fraud prevention for digital commerce at Cashstar. He is responsible for ensuring the veracity, and I'm not really sure what that word is, so you're gonna have to help me out with that, Liam, of over 10 million digital commerce orders a year for over 300 major retail uh, sales across the globe. And, this includes top brands such as Starbucks, Best Buy, Home Depot, Uber, uh, just to name a few. So thank you so much, Liam, for being with us here today. Um, we have a few questions we'll kind of start off with, and then uh, we'll open it up to some questions from the audience as well. Okay, sure. Um, thanks, Katie. Uh, you know, always uh, enjoyable for me to talk a little bit about cybersecurity because in the world we live in it's uh, a constant threat it's a billion dollar industry to steal people's credentials and uh and we're trying to get in the way of that and interrupt that practice and, and keep people safe from the fraudsters uh you know in in, in the company that i work for cash star which is a black hawk network owned company um, we represent uh, over 300 retailers across the the globe and you mentioned some of them starbucks and best buy and home depot and and there's a tremendous amount of digital uh, commerce happening with those retailers. And our job is to make sure that, that those transactions are legitimate and that the people that are making those purchases are authorized to do so with the credit card uh, that they're using. So that's what we're there to do. And, and uh, we've been doing it for uh, over 12 years now at Cash Star right here in, in Portland, Maine. Uh, and we've had some great success. Um, what I will say, and there's there's a lot to it, and obviously we won't cover all of it. I'll give you some some basics, and then I'd love to take some questions. But what I will say um, is that there is no silver bullet to security, and good security takes uh, a little effort. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody hates the most is passwords. It's it's really challenging to remember them, and and you've got to have so many different variations. Um, but what I will promise you is that a little diligence. Uh, will pay dividends and it will be a fraction of the time that you'll have to spend if you get hacked and have to try to do recovery. So, um, so just know that the, the good practices that you get uh, to become part of your habit will pay uh, down the road if, uh, if you can stay safe from hackers. Um, so a couple of things that I would, I would cover. Um, the most prevalent type of fraud that we see right now, and, and what I'll say is, uh, fraudsters won't let any crisis go to waste. So we're in a crisis net right now with, uh, with our health uh, concerns and fraudsters are taking full advantage of that. And they do that in a variety of ways. They play upon panic and they play upon a sense of urgency uh, and they're going to do what we call as phishing and social engineering. So phishing is when a fraudster attempts to gain information about you through uh, other mediums, so social media, your LinkedIn profile, uh, various different uh, social platforms you use, Twitter, uh, whatever it is, they're gonna try to gain information about you that they can then use against you uh, in a variety of ways. One of those ways that we see very prevalently happening right now is called victim-assisted fraud. And a fraudster is gonna come to you pre uh, pretending to be somebody that you know, a position of authority in your business probably, and tell you that they need you to do something urgently. In, in my business, that would be they need you to buy gift cards and send them to the, the supervisor that's demanding or requesting this. 
Uh, and they're going to do that by what we call spoofing that executive or that boss's email address. It's going to look like it's coming from that person. So it'll look like it's coming from Liam Summers. I'm, I'm emailing Katie and I say, Katie, I need you to buy me 10 $500 Best Buy gift cards and send those numbers to me for a promotion we're running. And Katie might go, oh, it's coming from Liam. Liam's an executive in the company. He has authority to ask that. I'll, get the, I'll go buy those on my purchase card. I'm going to send them the numbers and, and everybody's happy. And what actually happens is then the fraudster harvests those numbers, obviously steals all that money. And, and Katie gets a notice from finance saying, hey, why did you spend all this money at Best Buy? And she said, well, Liam told me. And Liam says, no, I didn't. Uh, and that is called uh, spoofing and phishing. So I, I, I fished Katie. I found out where she worked. I went on her social media. Uh, saw uh, you know on on her LinkedIn and saw who her boss might be or who she, who the executives of that company might be. I then spoofed their email address so it looked like it was coming from one of those people to Katie. Made a request for Katie with urgency. I need these right now. We have a promotion going. It's very urgent. Katie then, as she you know wants to do a good job for the company, immediately fulfills that request. Fraudster wins. Uh, and so that is that is what we're seeing a lot of right now because there's a lot of urgency and a lot of panic in the market right now, um, and and hackers are and and fraudsters are taking advantage of that. So what should you do about those kinds of things? And that's that's very basic, right? That's that is something that we're seeing all the time. What should you do to protect yourself from that type of behavior? There's a couple of things you should always do. One, you should always ask yourself, why am I getting this email? Do, did I expect to receive an email from uh, an executive in my company asking me for something? Has that ever happened before? Two, why is there so much urgency behind it? That's unusual, okay? And then three, you should always go to the person who's sending you that email and validate they know they sent it to you. So I sent Katie email, I want 10 $500 Best Buy cards and I need them quick, quick, quick. Katie, all she has to do is pick up the phone and say, hey, Liam, I just got this email from you. Just want to make sure that we're, we all are aligned on where you want me to send those. And at that point, I'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. So that interrupts the fraudster's ability to harvest the, the goods that they get from you. And, and they walk away empty handed and you're protected. Another thing you should always do when you get an email from somebody unexpected is click on their name on the email. So the email is going to say, coming from Liam. But if I click on it, it's going to say a random domain because it's being spoofed from somewhere. So I will be able to click on that. It will expose the entire domain. It will say, you know, Bobby Sue at junkdomain.org. Well, that's not Liam's email address for my company. So I know we have a problem. So you can always expose the full email address if you click on the name in the email from the from uh, portion of your email. Yeah, can I so, stop you just for one second and ask a quick question because this is really timely. Um, uh, at Keller Williams, we actually had something happen over the weekend similar to this in that our team leader's um, cell phone, uh, we all, like hundreds of people in the company got a text message from him, but it wasn't really him. So can you speak to that part a little bit? Sure, that's spoofing. So okay. we all know telemarketers have used this for years and fraudsters use it for years. And what they do is they pretend they can spoof, they can mimic the number. It's coming from somewhere else. They, they uh, spoof it, they wrap a fake number around it. And then you're seeing the fake number. And you've seen this from telemarketers. You get a call and it seems from a local number and you pick it up thinking, oh, I don't know who this is a local number, but you pick it up and then it's from some telemarketer and you can't call that number back because it doesn't exist. Spoofers can do the same thing. They can pretend to be a phone number that you recognize. So again, from social media or from phishing, I've gotten information about you or your company. I've gotten the executive's number that people will respond to. And now all I have to do is create a message coming from that phone number. It creates a call to action. Everybody got it, big urgent call to action. And all the fraudster needs is one person, one person to do the wrong thing. So he can fail a lot of times and all he needs to do is be successful once to gain access to what he wants and so they send out a bunch of texts they know they're not going to get everybody to respond to this text but all they need is one and as soon as that one person responds or gives information that they're asking for that fraudster now has the keys to the kingdom that they came to get 
right? And that's how they do it. So they'll spoof that number. They're faking, they're pretending, and they're showing you a number that you're going to recognize or a message, text message coming from somebody that you recognize, but it's not really from them. And there's always a call to action. There's always a, I need some information from you, or I need you to do something urgently. Because they want people to have a visceral reaction, a, a kind of a panic. Oh, oh, this person needs us immediately. I've got to get, we're, we're conditioned to that, right? Boss asks, I deliver. And that's what the fraudsters uh, are relying on. They want that visceral reaction. They want you to not stop and think. They want you just to do because you're, you're trying to react quickly. So we all have to pause. We have to ask ourselves those questions. Why am I getting this? Did I expect to get this? And if I called that person, would they know they sent it to me? Right? And if we all just take that one pause and ask ourselves those questions, we can interrupt the fraudster's ability to get what they want. So, um, so you that, mentioned earlier something about um, talking about passwords. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you should go about creating and managing your passwords? Yeah, so this is the biggest bugaboo for everybody, right? Nobody likes passwords. Everybody forgets them. Yeah, then you have to do the whole password reset dance, which is terrible. Um, and so what do we do as humans? We try to make it simple for us to remember. We try to, we rely on probably the same password for a variety of our sites um, because one is easier to remember than a dozen. Um, and we do things that we think create complexities, but don't, and I'll give you an example. I might think that if I spelled my name with a combination of letters and numbers and maybe used a dollar sign in there for my last name, Summers, instead of the S, I'll use a dollar sign, that I'm being really complex and hard to figure out. What people don't understand passwords are hacked. There's a variety of ways. First of all, passwords are often gained on a mass level. So if a corporate entity has an exposure, your information is part of that corporate entity. You went and stayed at a hotel or you shopped at a, a store that had an exposure. Your information is then exposed and hackers are buying that information in bulk. Okay, it's cheap. Um, so that's one way. The other way is that hackers use a variety of, of uh, code decryption programs that can cycle through uh, of, you know, all of these password variations really fast. If, it, if you knew how quickly it would take for a hacker to break a password for, that you're using that you think is complex, it would shock you. It's milliseconds. That's how quick. Uh, and so passwords themselves have to be not just complex. So it's, you know, I can't just use my name uh, and, and have some symbol in, in embedded in my name or random capitalization to think that that's going to do it because a hacker is going to be able to, to break that really quickly. You also never want to use, never, never, never want to use personal information of any sort in your password. Not your dog's name, not your kid's birthday, not your favorite color, not the car you used to drive as a high schooler. All of that is uh, uh, obtainable through social media in, in some way or another. And it's all really easy to decrypt using some of these programs that I'm talking about. So you always wanna stay away from personal information. So what does that mean? It means here comes the difficult part that you have to manage because you're protecting yourself. And anything that you do, when you protect yourself, you're willing to invest some time and effort to do it. Passwords are no different. You're protecting your entire identity, your banking information, and all your personal information by doing this, this work. So what do you do? Phrases are much more secure than words. And so if I wanted to be a secure person, I might use instead of, um, you know, uh, a, a standard word, I might use a phrase instead that says, I like to dance. And I might have I and like capitalized. I might use a random uh, check digit in between those, so a space or a number sign or a hyphen in between those words. And the reason for that is uh, the decryption programs looking at password um, books, essentially, and they're, they're putting combinations together. They have a really hard time when you create a phrase as a password. are non-linear for decryption programs, especially phrases that are nonsensical. 
So instead of, I love to dance, if you really wanted to be secure, it would be, I like cauliflower blue. Because that is not anything that a decryption program would marry up. They're looking at all of the words possible in the dictionary. They're looking at all of the ways that the most common words are being used in the English language. And by and large, people stick to those common words or phrases or, or conventions. And so by saying things like, I love dance cauliflower blue, it's almost impossible for a hacker to decrypt that. Now, that's a little more challenging to remember. I get it, right? But, it, but what is your personal security worth? And so instead of, uh, and, you, and you, you can never reuse, like you don't wanna reuse a password for all of your sites. So if I have that as my Netflix password, I certainly don't want to have it for my Bank of America password because if you get the access to one and I've reused them everywhere, you get the access to all. So you don't want to do that. So first of all, phrases, not words, never personal information and complexity does equal security. People have to stop thinking that if I make it really complex, I capitalize every other letter and I add a dollar sign in there um, that complexity equals difficulty to break it does not it just means it's harder for you to remember it's not harder for the hacker to hack uh, and so all you're doing is you're creating complexity which eventually you'll become frustrated with and you'll resort back to a simple password because you can remember it because we're human beings and we don't like to remember complexity it's very difficult but i could remember i love cauliflower blue a lot better than dollar sign hashtag exclamation point random capitalization dash, colon, you, nobody can remember that. Um, so, so complexity doesn't equal security. Phrases, always better than words. And never, ever, ever any personal content in a password. Awesome. That's really helpful. And um, I got a little work to do after this, after we're done here. <laughs> yeah. And, and listen, there are a variety of password management programs that you can you can buy that will help you retain these passwords and manage them. Um, we use LastPass, which is a password program. Uh, it's, it, you know, and again, you'll need a master password that's very secure because now you've got a, a, a repository of all your passwords. But that way you can manage these passwords in a logical fashion. You don't have to remember every phrase you've ever created. The password manager will do that for you. So all you have to remember is, how do I access my password manager? Here's that phrase, right? So a password manager, certainly uh, a great option uh, as well. Touch this, but really the most secure method is two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is whereby password does not allow you entry. You have to have a randomly generated computer code that comes from an authenticator that you also have to enter. So even if the best hacker in the world figured out your I love cauliflower blue password, which they won't, but even if they did, they would then have to have the code that is being randomly generated by your authenticator. It's a whole other layer of security, um, probably far deeper than we can get to in this discussion, but two-factor authentication, people should probably take a look at that and see if that fits in their ability to manage. That is the most secure way to protect yourself in the environment we're in. Remember, fraudsters only have to get lucky one time. That's it, one time. There's, they, and it's very cheap. They can buy blocks of uh, tens of thousands of passwords in a chunk for very little money. We, we look at the dark web all the time and see where these passwords are coming from. Also buy blocks and blocks of credit card numbers, very cheap. You know, they're fine. So, it does take a little diligence. It does take a little more work than, you know, my password is my dog's name and I can always remember that, but the fraudster is going to know that pretty quickly too. So it takes a little work, but I promise you again, the work you put in will pay itself out to you in spades by not getting hacked and having to do a recovery act. Awesome. Thank you. So I want to open it up and see if anyone here has any questions that's for Liam or... Looks like Mr. Townsend does. Go ahead, Mr. Townsend. Liam, I, I have two questions for you. Um, number number one, companies like LastPass, which which we we actually use as well, um, it, are they more targeted by hackers? Because talk about keys to the kingdom. 
Uh, if yeah. they were able to hack into LastPass, that's where all the passwords are. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fair question, and I am sure that uh, hackers would love to get those keys of the kingdom. LastPass uses uh, military-grade encryption, though. Yep. So uh, the, the ability for a hacker to get in uh, is almost impossible. Okay. Now, I won't say it's impossible because nothing is impossible, but hackers have easier targets. Now, remember, hackers are going to go to the path of least resistance. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to make your world a little more difficult than someone else's world. Yeah. And then, I, and then I'll just flow to someone else's world. So if your world is hard for me to access or to hack, I know there's a host of people out there that aren't, and my time is going to be spent on those folks. This Last is is similar. They're using encryption that's military grade. It's really, it would be really, really hard next to impossible for someone to break that but there are other things like retailers that are super easy and yeah. i can get a lot of value from that great thank you and then the the second question is um you know a lot of us are, are on social media various platforms uh, i'm most familiar with, with facebook um you you must cringe when you see some of those games i've actually found myself commenting um are all of those engineered by somebody to get information? Like the most recent one is, you know, name the city you were born in and every other city you've lived in, including current. Like yeah. that, that, that's not somebody sitting at home saying this would be fun to do. That's a hacker that's getting that to go viral. Well, so here's what I'll say. Are all of those created by hackers? No, but all of them are used by hackers. And so every time, and, and look, I, I, we've all been guilty of it. You know, you get the, you get that kind of rush to play along with folks and, and we've all fallen prey to that. But every time you put something of value onto your social media that a hacker can use against you, they will. Whether it's benign, you know, I sent you a link to we're playing a game and it kind of goes viral or targeted. Hackers are absolutely creating these things to, you know, kind of get you, incentivize you to give up personal information, where you were born what city you were born in, what's your favorite color, what your dog's name is, all of that they know, by and large, is gonna be beneficial to their efforts to steal from you. So yeah, I wouldn't play them. Uh, I would avoid them like the plague, because even if they are benign, the person didn't intend it, you to be subject to any risk by playing it, somebody's gonna harvest that. Thank you for putting that out for me, that made it easier, now I can hack Scott's accounts. Thank you. Um, the other thing I did want to say real quick uh, while we're here is there is a population that is targeted, absolutely targeted, and it's cruel how they do it, but there's a population that is targeted by hackers, and that is an elderly population who are less tech savvy. They love to send these folks things from the government, from the IRS, from right now it's the World Health Organization. These are all fake things, and, and our senior folks are less uh, technically savvy to kind of figure out that those are not real. Our duty, if we're, you know, uh, protecting our, our relatives properly, is to inform them that these things exist. So it's not just protecting yourself, it's protecting your family as well. So reach out to your mom and your dad and your grandparents and say, hey, there's, this thing's going on. If you get any notifications from the IRS or from the World Health Organization, let me know. Or from the census, let me know. And, and I'll take a look at it because the absolutely target them. They are easy prey and, uh, and, and the hackers are, are making hay while the sun is shining in a health crisis. Yeah. Uh, any other questions out there? No. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Liam, for joining us. Really great information and always nice to see you. My dog says hello too. She missed you. Hey <laughs> Uh, hope you and your family are, in fact, you know, uh, doing really well. It looks like you are from what I can see on social media. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I really appreciate your time. So, uh, yep. Bye, everybody out there on Facebook land. Thanks for tuning okay. in. Um, this call has been recorded, so we'll probably replay it uh, and also send out uh, via email if somebody is interested. Um, get in touch with me. Um, give me a call, 207-730-2081. Happy to pass along the information to you. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thanks for putting this up. Thank you, Liam. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.